Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast episode of Andy's Witchcraft by me, Andy, or Sacred Moon. I hope you're all having a wonderful fall season, that the weather maybe starts to cool down a bit, and you can enjoy uh, the weather and the nice abundance um, that the universe has provided. Today's episode is going to be a lot of opinion based. So if you're not interested in hearing my opinion, maybe not we'll stick around to this. But there's also fact based in um, today I'm going to discuss things that the Roman Catholic Church believes in that I don't. So if you're interested in hearing some of the Roman Catholic Church's beliefs for whatever reason, you can maybe stick around and tune out the part where I spew about my opinion and my deconstruction journey a bit. So let's get started with this. Uh, the first thing I want to discuss is the Nicene's Creed. Um, this is a creed that the in my church we um, chant sort of um, after the gospel is read and the priest supposedly discusses the gospel. And I say supposedly because these days my priest has not been talking about the gospel. Rather, he's talking about politics, which he really shouldn't, um, and specifically the protests going on um, with uh, attacking trans rights, um, which, number one, that's the first thing the Roman Catholic Church believes in that I disagree with. Um, let people live. Schools are not preaching about uh, teaching kids to be gay or teaching kids to be trans and I think that is just a big misconception that the Roman Catholic Church believes in so I guess that's the first one <laughs> but anyways after all that drama and slight bs we pre we read the Nicene's Creed and I'm gonna read the whole thing and then I'm going to highlight the parts that I disagree with so the Nicene's Creed goes we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered, and was buried. On the third day, he rose according to the scriptures, ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So that is the Nicene's Creed. Now let's highlight the parts that I don't agree with. From the get-go, I don't agree with this. Uh, the first part that says we believe in one God, um, I don't believe in one God. I believe in all the gods. I worship one God. Um, in my practice, I venerate one God, which not everyone does, but um, I venerate one God, um, but I don't believe in only one God. So already from there, I don't agree with. Um, as well as the sort of half, the maker of heaven and earth. I believe that Yahweh created um, heaven and earth along with other gods. So they all kind of work together to create their own parts of the universe. Um, and so, and that's how kind of like they got their specializations because some gods have special, you know, like Poseidon is the god of the seas. So he probably had a part in creating these seas um, in my belief. But yeah, so that's, already you know something I disagree with in this Nicene's Creed the next part that I disagree with is the part that goes true God from true God I don't think there is one true God there are many true gods because Yahweh is not for everyone especially people who went through religious trauma 
um, and he acknowledges this and is okay with it as long as they're still trying to love and respect themselves and others, no issue there. So he's not the sole truth because many other deities and spiritual beings proclaim the exact same message of love and respect for humanity that Yahweh does. And so how can Yahweh be right and everyone else be wrong if everyone else is saying the same thing Yahweh is saying? It doesn't make any sense. So already from there, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the part that goes through him, all things were made. Again, we're returning to the concept that he created some things. Um, and maybe all things had a little bit of Yahweh in them, but he didn't do it solely on his own. Um, again, that's my personal belief. The next part that um, I disagree with would be... Um, the, uh, he shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. So, I'm not sure if I believe that Jesus will come to earth again in the exact same way that the Catholic Church does. Um, I feel like if he were to come again, he would have already, especially with all the BS going on on earth today. Um, I feel like, you know, as the Christian, as the Christians and evangelicals, I should say, actually, as evangelical community, fear mong mongers and claims that the rapture is happening, he would have came already. He would have came the first three times they claimed the rapture was coming. Um, but I do believe that Yahweh and Asherah, who I believe is the Holy Spirit, uh, play a role in um, determining whether we are reincarnated or not. So in that sense, they do judge quote unquote, the living and the dead. But I do not think Jesus judges the living and the dead. Um, he gives people God's message in saying that they are forgiven, but he is not the one doing the forgiving. Um, because Jesus is the son of God and he is not God himself. So uh, the Catholic Church believes that Jesus is God, but God is not Jesus. That weird um, concept, construct. Um but I don't believe that Jesus is God. Um, he is the son of God. So because of that, he has a special connection to God. And like I said, he forgives others through God. Um, but yeah, so that's my point of view on that. And then, fi uh, not finally, but the... <laughs> this, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now... You already know, I deconstructed. If I wasn't forced to go to church, I wouldn't go at all. Um, so I obviously do not believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, that's just a big nope in my eyes. There is no one right way. Um, no. Uh, and then the same as confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I am all for baptism. Jesus was baptized um, in the Bible. I'm all for it. But I think it's more to show spiritual cleansing. Um, and it's something that even witches and pagans do um, and Buddhists do and Jews do. There are so many religions that have that spiritual cleansing of water. Um, so I do not believe that you have to be baptized in the church. Um, I believe that you can go into the lake or the ocean and say, God, cleanse me of my sins. Um, or God cleanse me mind, body, and spirit so that I can have some inner peace and he will do the cleansing. Uh, you do not need a priest to do that because the priest isn't the son of God. Only the son of God to me can give the exact perfect message of God. That's why we're all flawed and that's why the church preaches things they claim are from God but aren't because we humans are flawed. Um, and that's just the way that it is. Even Jesus had some flaws. We all know Jesus was an angry man and he had anger issues. And there's tons of moments in the Bible where he was angry. And so that was his human side coming out. And so because of that, he was not 100% perfect. But when it came to giving messages from God, because he had that special connection of being his son, he was, you know, capable of giving that perfect 100% message and it was only when it was written down and translated and mistranslated and humans kind of screwed it up that God's message got skewed. So moral of the story, you don't have to really 
you don't need a priest to forgive you of your sins from God. You don't need to be baptized and cleanse of your sins by a priest. There are tons of ways you can do it on your own, just between you and God, as all things really should be. The next concept that I disagree with is called transubstantiation. This is the concept that the bread and wine literally turn into the body and blood of Christ. In my opinion, it's not literally the body and blood of Christ. Um, That's kind of a weird concept to me. I'm just like, how is this literally body and wine? It's No, I believe it's more of a metaphor. The bread and the wine represent Jesus' sacrifice. He died because the government did not like him spreading God's word um, instead of spreading the law. And instead of giving in to them, he rebelled and he sacrificed his life for his beliefs and the beliefs of those who followed him and Yahweh. And so it's a metaphor. It's it's sacrifice. Um, and that that's... That's how my point of view is. So I don't believe in transubstantiation like the Roman Catholic Church does. Now, I feel like it's important to point that not all Christian branches believe in this. And that's why they kind of separated and um, created their own religions. It was tiny differences like this. Like some some churches believed in it. Some churches didn't. So some evangelicals actually don't believe in transubstantiation. So... Um, anyways, this concept brings me to my next point, um, and it's the meaning of quote unquote died for our sins. Now, I do believe Jesus died for our sins, but not in the same way the church does, because if he died for our sins in the way that the church believes, I believe that nobody would sin anymore. If he truly died for our sins, then our sins would have died with him. But very clearly, humanity is flawed, we still sin, and so... Clearly, the church, the Catholic Church's interpretation is a little bit off. Um, the church believes that without Jesus dying on the cross, no one would have eternal life in heaven. Um, to me, that is flawed. That doesn't make any sense. Um, because are you saying that people in the Old Testament who lived and died are not in heaven? But then you claim that Moses and all the prophets are in heaven because they were passages from God. But then you're saying that, but this was before Jesus died on the cross. So if Jesus died on the cross, gave us a way to heaven, then how could those people go to heaven before Jesus died on the cross? And we go into this loophole cycle where it's like, wait, it's like time travel, the concept. If you didn't time travel, then this wouldn't happen, but then that wouldn't happen, but then you wouldn't have time traveled. And it's like, (laughs) Um, and yeah, so like I said, people went to heaven before Jesus lived and died. And again, go to my reincarnation episode if you want to understand how I believe we get to heaven. But we, it's it just before Jesus died, we didn't have anybody who knew what happened after death. We didn't know. Nobody told us there was a heaven. So people died, they went to heaven, but those alive didn't know that. And so when Jesus came to earth, him being the son of God, he knew the truth about the afterlife and he revealed the truth about heaven and quote unquote hell. So Jesus died because of the government, Okay. But God decided instead of li- him living and continuously suffering persecution, because let's be real, if Jesus saved himself and came down from that cross, they would have said witchcraft and they would have kept trying to kill him and he would have been hunted down for the rest of his life. Nobody would just take the word and be like, oh, he really is the son of God. There would always be someone to be like, no, witchcraft, demonology, die. <laughs> um, and he was, you know, he wouldn't live peacefully. So God decided, okay, let these people witness you dying on the cross, come join me. And then when you return in three days, um, you know, you can spread the word to those who you want to show yourself to. And then not everyone has to know you're still alive kind of thing, which FYI, my interpretation on that is a little different. And we'll get back to that. (laughs) Um, So when Jesus died, his followers knew that faith was all they had left. And they relied on their faith in God and Jesus to keep them going. That was what saved them. So even though we still sin, uh, we were rescued by faith. And that's what Jesus gave us when he died on the cross. It was faith that he is in a better place. And 
we will get to reunite with him someday. Knowing that God forgives all who want to be forgiven helped humanity and helped their faith. Without Jesus living and then dying, we wouldn't know that we are worth God's love and forgiveness. Because unlike what the church tells us, we are worthy of God. My biggest pet peeve is when the church and the priests say we do not deserve to be forgiven. What are you talking about? If God created me the way that I am, I am worthy of God, okay? We are worthy of God. We are worthy of forgiveness. Don't let any priest, don't let any church tell you otherwise. If we were not worthy, why would he bother creating us? Tell me that. Jesus came and taught us this, okay? So yeah, Jesus' life and death indirectly saved us, but we would have gone to heaven regardless of whether he died. And yeah. So, number four, my fourth disagreement is hell is a place you'll be stuck in for eternity. Again, go back to my reincarnation episode for more details, but the gist is reincarnation is hell. Coming back on earth with all this suffering and pain is hell. Um, of course, there are good things because I don't believe that God will want us to only suffer and that's it. I think he would give us good things too, but heaven is a place with no suffering. So if you really want to go there, you got to try to get out of this cycle of reincarnation by being a decent human being. <laughs> um, number five uh, is the concept of original sin. Now, I don't think that we inherit sins from our relatives and ancestors. I don't believe we are suffering and sinning because Eve ate the apple, which FYI was a metaphor for you know what. Um, and so... I, I don't believe that. That's, that's weird to me. Um, we can inherit the tendency to sin um, because exposure, um, because of hearing these stories, just like you can kind of inherit trauma. If you've heard of generational trauma, that is the tendency to be traumatized because of your history, but you're not actually born with that trauma. That trauma is triggered by an exposure to something traumatic and then the generational trauma continues. So we are born with a tendency to sin, but not to sin themselves. And so it's not up to us to be forgiven for our ancestors' sins. It's not up to us to make up for Eve's screw up or Adam's screw up or whatever. I don't believe that. What I do believe is we need to make amends for the sins of our own past lives. Like I said, I believe in reincarnation. If you, unless you are a first reincarnate, you have been on this earth before and you will continue to be on this earth until you have reached enlightenment. But, so you have to make up for the sins that your consciousness made in the previous lives. But you do not have to um, be make up for your mom's sins or your grandma's sins or your grandpa's sins or your great uncle's sins. You don't have to make up for any of those. That is not on you. That's on them. When they get reincarnated, they have to make up for that. The sixth concept is you have to go to church every Sunday to keep the Sabbath day holy. No. Where in the commandments that God said, keep the Lord's day holy. Where did it say by going to church? Or back then it would have been by going to the synagogue. No. He said keep it holy. That means loving and respecting yourself. Loving and respecting others. Maybe fasting if that's your spiritual path. Doing something that requires a little bit of sacrifice to help someone. Maybe your own soul. Maybe someone else. You know, That is keeping the day holy. Giving yourself time to practice self-care. That is being holy. Self-care is the holiest thing you can do. So having that day to rest, not to work, relax, practice self-care, eat your favorite food, splurge on some ice cream, whatever you got to do. You don't have to go to church to keep the day holy. The seventh thing is there is no divine feminine. There's no queen of heaven, nothing. Well, my church believes that Mother Mary is the queen of heaven, but that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, to me, the Holy Spirit is the queen of heaven. Um, and that is Asherah. Asherah is a divine feminine. And the fact that the church denies the femininity of the Holy Spirit makes me so irritated. Like the fact that they call the church the wife of God. No, a building is not God's wife. 
this building of wood and bricks, this inanimate object, is not God's wife. Stop it. I, I suspect that it's because they want to maintain their claim that the church is the way to God. And if you want to be married to God, you have to go to church. And that's just, again, that's a weird thing. So no, I don't agree with that. Asherah is God's wife. Asherah is the queen of heaven. Mother Mary would be like the princess of heaven. Um, because Jesus was the prince of heaven, really, if you think about it. He was the king of the Jews, but he was the prince of heaven. Um, and so, yeah, that's my little spew of that. <laughs> The eighth concept that I disagree with, and this is going to be a long one, so bear with me, is called apostolic succession. Let me explain. In Christian theology, the doctrine asserts that chosen successors of the apostles enjoy the same authority, power, and responsibility as was conferred upon the apostles by Jesus. Now, let me speak to this in English terms. I kind of got that off a website, so bear with me. This means that bishops who are chosen by humans are successors of the previous bishops. And this goes back to the apostles. So the disciples chose bishops and the, those bishops chose more bishops and those bishops chose more bishops. I'll try saying that 10 times fast. Um, and then it continued. And these people decided you are now blessed with the same power Jesus gave to us. And it goes on to the previous bishops would get kind of promoted and those ones promoted and those ones promoted until you reach the Pope. And the voice of the Pope, either alone or with other bishops in his council, is seen as infallible. Infallible, guys. This human is speaking the total truth when speaking of matters of faith and moral. Now, already the, the word infallible is wrong because humans are by nature fallible. Unless you are God himself. Even God himself had flaws, okay? He was an angry man. I'm not going to say he was perfect. No. But even God himself had flaws. And you mean to tell me that God who had flaws, this person is flawless in giving God's message. No. No, <laughs> by claiming that these popes are infallible, they're claiming that they are godly or equal to God. Whether they like it or not, pop, now they'll have loopholes that saying, oh no, because we're giving God's message. So we're not God himself. We're just his microphone kind of thing. No, 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 no. Don't, don't play that with me. No, 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 no. You are saying you're godly or equal to God because according to the church, God is the only infallible being in the universe. So if God is the only person who is the total truth, but then you're saying this Pope is the total truth. You are either saying that this guy is God or you're saying this guy is Jesus. Because like I said, Jesus was the only one capable of giving God's perfect truth message. But this guy, now they claim this Pope is capable of doing the same thing. He is not Jesus. And I'm not... As my uncle said once, and this made me laugh my butt off, he said, I'm not going to bow down to a man wearing a funny hat. Now, I wouldn't use those words because I would want to be respectful, as Buddha says, but that's pretty much the gist of my beliefs. Yeah, I'm not going to bow down and claim that this guy is, is giving me the total truth that Jesus would give me or that God would give me. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. Because God is not choosing these priests and bishops and popes. Um, God's not choosing them. Humans are choosing them. And listen to this, the requirements to become a priest, um, which FYI do require a background check, but who's to say that all the criminals get caught? So you, there's no way to guarantee that. And FYI, we all know with the histories, some criminal priests did get through this process. Becoming a priest requires one undergraduate degree. That's four years of school, any, any program. Four years of study in theology at a seminary. One year as a transitional deacon. Um, and so, and then five years from your college graduation to ordainment. So, it's a long process, but not once there does it say 
anything about God choosing the, the priest. And then popes is even worse with popes, guys. It's even worse. So after many years, you work your way up, bishop, archbishop, blah, 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 blah. And then to become the pope, you are voted on by an assembly of cardinals. You are voted. There's a democracy here. And we all know, if we vote in a prime minister, our prime ministers are flawed here in Canada, man. Like, they're not perfect. So now these popes are being voted. Now, how is this process flawless? How is the pope chosen by cardinals, by humans, how are they going to pick someone who's infallible word of God? You never know the intent of priests or bishops or archbishops or popes. You never know what they want. Most of them want money and power. And let's be real, in Canada, which claims to be secular, we are very much run by Catholic beliefs. And it's even more so in America. Literally, yeah. in Canada, in our national anthem, we say, God keep our land glorious and free. Literally, our national anthem has a mention of God. It's not secular. So to be a pope, you have the highest power. You have even more power than the prime minister, in my opinion. So most of these people want that. Now, not all of them. There are, there's one pope in particular. I can't remember his name, but he actually gave me good vibes. And I'm an intuitive person, so I can tell if someone has decent vibes or bad vibes. There's probably been... There have, since I was conscious i guess like there maybe have been more when i was a baby but from my recollection there have been three popes in my lifetime and one of those three gave me good vibes and that was mainly because out loud he said he would allow same-sex marriage in the church dependent on if each church wanted to and of course none of the churches wanted to but FYI, if the Pope is the infallible word of God and this Pope is saying same-sex marriage is okay as long as you're loving God and loving, respecting one another, but then you're saying that that Pope is wrong. Hello? The hypocrisy. So, already there, there are issues there. Um, and yeah, these individuals may not really have a connection to God. Um, and I don't need him. I don't need a Pope to connect me to God. I can connect to God myself. I have the Holy Spirit within me. The church claims you all have the Holy Spirit in you. So if I have the Holy Spirit in me, if I have Asherah, God's wife within me, then why do I need someone else to give me a connection to God? I don't need anyone saying I'm holier than you. I know more about God's will than you. When they've had the same amount of education as I have, I finished a bachelor's degree. Now I'm going to go get a master's degree and then hopefully a PhD degree. I'm going to have the same amount of education as you, but in a different field. And then you're going to claim that you know more about God than I do. No, it doesn't work like that. We are all equal in God's eyes. Nobody is holier than anyone. It's not fair that we are forced to believe that God's will is only told by humans who are elected by other humans. So unless God himself comes to me and tells me that this particular individual is holier than I and he is the next son of God, then I am not going to believe it. Unless God or Jesus comes down and says, this man is worthy of being called a disciple, I'm going to assume they have the same God-given abilities to determine God's will as I do. I don't have more than them, and they don't have more than me. End of discussion. So number nine, now that I've calmed down a bit, <laughs> you have to confess your sins to a priest for it to be a true confession. Let me tell you, based on my research, this concept came from John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. It says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And also James chapter 5 to verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Now, they were like, oh, so we have to confess our sins to one another. Well, if we want to claim that the church is the way to God, then they have to confess their sins in the church, which means they have to confess their sins to a priest. Okay, so then they came up with this concept that you have to confess your, your sins to a priest. Now, I got into a little bit of a debate with an evangelical. I went to grade school with him, not fun. Um, and he, we, he, we got into a debate, and he, he was angry because our priest basically said, 
you don't need to go to confession to be forgiven. And he just gave, the priest gave a general blessing to everyone in the church and says, you are forgiven of your sins, go in peace. And then that's it. And then this evangelical got mad and he got into a debate and then I was kind of dragged into it and whatever. And it was funny because he says, you have to go to confession to, to a priest. I said, why? He goes, because the point of confession is for you to tell your sins out loud. Because I told him, why can't I just pray in my room and to God and say, God, forgive me of my sins. He goes, you have to confess your sins out loud. And where, where does out loud mean to a priest? If anything, it would make more sense if I sinned against someone else. Let's say I, I called my sister a jerk face. Why would going to a priest and saying, I called my sister a jerk face today. How is that going to help me be forgiven? I should be going to my sister and saying, sorry, I, I called you a jerk face. I'm, I'm sorry, my bad. That would make more sense to forgive a sin because God sees you're actually sorry. You're actually sorry that you called her a jerk face. So you're forgiven because you're genuinely sorry. There are many people who don't feel sorry, who go to a priest and say, I want to be confessed of my sins so I can get to heaven, but they're not actually sorry. Tell me how it makes sense that it's legal to confess to murder to a priest and it's confidential. The priest can't even be subpoenaed by the court, nothing. It's confidential 100%. But how is that fair? You think God actually will forgive you for murdering someone? Cain married, uh, Cain murdered his brother and said, sorry, God, I killed my brother and he wasn't forgiven. <laughs> so how is a, a person on earth going to murder someone, go to, to a priest, confess to a priest and say, I'm sorry, I murdered someone. And they're like, oh, yep, you're forgiven. And they don't go to jail. They don't get any justice, nothing, nada. You're free to go. It would make more sense for them to go to the police and say, I murdered someone. Give me justice. That will make you forgiven. You are not going, to, you're not going to be forgiven by hiding behind your sins. It says right there, confess your sins to one another. Um, but to me, I interpret that. I look at that and I'm like, oh, so that's if I sin against someone, I have to go to that person and confess my sins to them and say sorry. But the church takes it a different way. So, but the moral of the story is neither of these verses really say that you have to confess to a priest. It says you have to confess your sins to each other, which means if you sin against someone, you should turn to that person. Again, it's going to go back to the previous point that priests are chosen by deacons and bishops, just people who are just like you and me. So just because I chose not to go to seminary does not mean that I, I can't forgive someone for hurting me. I, I, the priest has no right to forgive someone else for, for them harming me. If I'm getting smacked in the face senseless, if they, if I get punched in the face and then they go to the priest and the priest is like, yep, you're forgiven. What? I should be the one forgiving them. You punched me in the face. Hello. I should be forgiving you. <laughs> but regardless, that's the church. As Galatians chapter three, verse 24 says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So as long as I have faith in Christ Jesus, I can forgive you of sins, especially if they're against me. That is the end of this episode. I'm sorry it was more ventier than usual, but I hope you got some laughs out of it. Um, if you like that content and if you, if you want more, if you're listening to this on YouTube, give it a thumbs up and a comment and subscribe to my channel for more. If you're listening to it on Spotify, what are you waiting for? You should just follow me um, and listen to future podcast episodes. You could also follow me on social media. I will have that linked below. And you can join my Discord server, the Crystal Caverns. That'll be in my link tree. The link will be below that as well. And if you have a video suggestion that you want to hear, that's also in the link tree. Go to video ideas, fill out that Google form, and I will do an episode on the topic. That's about it for today. Blessed be everyone. Have a wonderful day, week, month, and year.